comment, we have the uh, University of Chicago's own Gary Harrigal, um, who has just put out a book called Manufacturing Possibilities, Creative Action and Industrial Recomposition in the United States, Germany, and Japan. And this just came out at Oxford University Press. So please uh, join me in welcoming all of our distinguished panelists. And right now, I'll just uh, see the podium. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and let me thank the uh, organizers, Moish and Anwin and, and others, for allowing a few foreign interlopers to attend this uh, conference of American academic eagles. Um, uh, what I'll be speaking to uh, is work that I and Sam Gindon have been doing for some time. Sam is here, uh, and uh, you can read some of it in more detail in the opening essay of this year's Socialist Register, uh, an essay uh, called uh, Capitalist Crises and the Crisis This Time. Uh, but uh, we've also this year put our little book on left alternatives that PM Press did called In and Out of Crisis. Uh, and uh, most of all, uh, we've been working on this for 10 years and we're finally almost finished a book called The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire, which is what this mainly comes from. You know, crises are classically, almost banally now, uh, known as turning points. That's the classical meaning of the term. And what's very clear is that if any of us expected that uh, a massive crisis like this would be a turning point in terms of restoring the fortunes of the left, they were uh, very wrong. Uh, the forces of the left uh, are so weak that in many ways this is turning out to be a crisis for the left, a crisis of the left, uh, with very few exceptions around the world. We might at least hope that this will be a turning point in how the left comes to think about crises and overcomes many of the debilitating ways that it has thought about crisis, which perhaps get in the way of what we need to do to strengthen the left. Uh, I mean that in the sense of the way the left has looked at the causes of crisis, the consequences of crises, the relationship of finance to crises, and above all, and I'll talk to this most of all, the relationship of the state to crisis. Uh, in terms of the causes of crises, uh, the falling rate of profit theory that we heard about yesterday was very popular in Marxist circles uh, during the 1873 to 96 crisis, the first great crisis of capitalism. Uh, with the recovery in 1896, uh, it passed away, that overaccumulation thesis, uh, and was displaced by an underconsumption explanation, which was the explanation behind the whole classical theory of inter-imperial rivalry. That is, uh, assuming the immiseration of the proletariat was not going to be overcome and no one had foreseen uh, Fordism at that time, writing on the left, uh, it was assumed that accumulation within uh, the uh, European capitalist countries and even within the United States, uh, picking up the frontier thesis, had reached its limit uh, and therefore uh, capitalist states were pushing beyond their borders, engaging in colonialization uh, in order to find new arenas for both surplus extraction but for investment. Uh, and that was, so far as there was an economistic explanation behind the inter-imperial rivalry thesis of classical Marxists at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, that was it. Um, yeah, it. It, of course, as someone pointed this out today, uh, was being undertaken to take this country as an example. This argument was being presented as an explanation for why there was intervention in Central America uh, by Teddy Roosevelt or in Cuba at a time when California, while the frontier had been reached, virtually had no deepening of capitalist social relations within it. Uh, had no sense of the extent to which uh, the accumulation that would take place in Nicaragua was uh, uh, minuscule in relation to the deepening of capital accumulation that would take place 
within uh, the United States itself. Uh, the underconsumption thesis uh, was picked up by Keynesians and, and was to some extent pushed by proto-Keynesians even then. Uh, but by the 1930s, Marx has turned to uh, explanations that were, again, over-accumulation explanations, uh, largely associated with notions of monopolization uh, because prices during the Great Depression got sticky, uh, whereas they hadn't been in the 1873 to 96 Depression. Uh, where competition had driven prices down and wages had been rather sticky given the mobility of labor, uh, which was greater than the mobility of capital at that time. As Gabriel Coco once pointed out, Europe's ability to export its reserve army was something that Marx had not foreseen and was one of the great safety valves of capitalist crisis. Uh, and, and we've been stuck with an overaccumulation thesis since the 30s most obviously associated with the monthly review people. Uh, but you know, from the 19, early 1950s on, the notion was that monopolized capital uh, is producing so much surplus it can't find a place to invest it. And insofar as they began to discern a growing financialization, uh, they saw this precisely in terms of uh, this thesis of overaccumulation. We got a different version of this, not based on the falling rate of profit thesis from Bob Brenner, uh, in, ex in ex uh, arguing that we'd never overcome the crisis of the 1970s because not enough fixed capital uh, was destroyed uh, after 1970s, after the 1970s crisis. And therefore, the argument has been, whether it's been the monthly review crowd, that we've essentially been in crisis, only uh, put off by bubbles, wars, etc. since the 1950s, or from Brenner, that we've been in crisis since the 70s because rates of profit didn't return to uh, the very high rates that they temporarily reached in the mid-1960s, um, and, and rates of growth didn't quite match what they <coughs> were in the golden age, uh, that we were, uh, we've been in crisis since uh, uh, the 1970s. All of the explanations, all the expectations that the current crisis uh, would be caused uh, by a profit squeeze uh, or by a decline in profits, or more commonly, the explanation that this crisis would be caused by the American trade deficit, the imbalances in trade, uh, none of them turned out to be correct. Profits were at a very high rate before the crisis hit, not in 2008, but in August 2007, which is when it began. It began in the financial sector. It was not due to imbalances. It was an American crisis, an American crisis in the sense that it emerged out of the contradictions of the financialization of everyday life. Um, and we need to try to understand why that happened and why it had such effects on production, of course. Uh, but, uh, and I think this is a crucial point with regard to getting past, finally, uh, the mistakes the left has made in trying to understand crises. And here, Sam and I have been running very much parallel to David Harvey's thinking in this. Uh, capital runs up against barriers as it seeks to expand, all kinds of barriers. Uh, and tr crises can be triggered uh, as it uh, confronts any of those barriers. Uh, the, the serious question is uh, not whether there's one explanation for capitalist crises, but rather why is it that most crises don't become long-term structural crises? Why most of them get resolved rather quickly? And to understand that, and here Sam and I draw very much on Giovanni Arrighi's brilliant essay back in the mid-70s, you know, his attempt to theorize capitalist crises. Uh, where he compares 1873 to 96, the 1930s and the 1970s. And we may well be in the fourth. Uh, and, and in order to understand why some crises last, uh, and here again, Duncan, I think, was pushing in this direction uh, yesterday, uh, you need to look at the balance of class forces and class structures and the roles of states and state capacities in relation to crises. Um, in, in each of uh, the uh, first three crises in different ways, labor had significant strength. What's so interesting about the current one was that labor was not a factor in causing this crisis. The strength of labor was not. I've referred to already the mobility of labor being an important factor in understanding the length and nature of the first great crisis of capitalism in the late 19th century. Uh, 
Uh, labor was important in understanding the second one, and this is Barry Eichengreen's argument, and a very correct one, uh, was that the winning of democracy by the great mass working class parties that had emerged uh, uh, in Europe uh, between 1896 and the 1920s uh, was that it made the automaticity of the gold standard impossible. Uh, it, it, as, as the gold standard was revived in the 1920s, uh, when crises hit, it made it impossible for governments, which were now elected by workers, to simply follow the automaticity required by the gold standard in terms of austerity. Uh, and that's why, when 1929 happened, so many of them so quickly uh, uh, introduced uh, restrictions on capital flows, restrictions on trade, uh, and, and went off gold. Uh, that was the fundamental factor uh, behind it. In the 1970s, uh, Sam and I are very much of the view, and again, Duncan uh, expressed that as well, that it was the strength of the working class in conditions of full employment capitalism uh, it, uh, that was the cause of the uh, inflationary tendencies, but in light of continuing competition, <coughs> increasing competition, in fact, at that time, this produced a profit squeeze, uh, and that was the source of uh, the uh, reduction in rates of profit uh, in the 1970s. It was added to, moreover, by uh, the pressures coming in terms of the social wage from the rise of social movements uh, at that time. Uh, now, it's very interesting, then, uh, to, to look at this crisis and see the extent to which uh, labor uh, and, uh, was not a factor, uh, the strength of labor was not a factor uh, in this crisis. In fact, uh, as I'll go on to argue, uh, the way in which labor was defeated as part of the resolution of the crisis of the 1970s lays the grounds for the further financialization of social life, the creation of uh, the uh, credit-driven uh, working-class attempt to maintain living standards uh, through borrowing, uh, which is then taken advantage of by every shyster in the business uh, in, in terms of uh, mortgage sales. I'll come back to this. Now, in terms of the consequences of crises, here again, it's about time we rid ourselves of some chivalry. Uh, by virtue of the fact that the uh, 1896 crisis uh, was followed by inter-imperial rivalry, there's been a tendency amongst people on the left to think that crises give rise to inter-imperial rivalry, uh, inevitably. Uh, and the expectation at every one has been that there would be uh, an emergence of inter-imperial rivalry as a result of crisis. It's certainly true that the globalizing tendencies, the globalization tendencies of the 19. Uh, 19th century were interrupted, it's true, by inter-imperial rivalry. And you could very well say that the Great Depression as well interrupted the attempt to revive capitalism's globalizing tendencies in the 1920s, yes. But the crisis of the 1970s, this is crucially important, did not interrupt capitalism's globalizing tendencies. On the contrary, they accelerated them and deepened them. The big question about this one is whether uh, they will be interrupted this time, and it doesn't look like it. On the contrary, uh, as the G20 Toronto Declaration made it made very clear, uh, the uh, heads of governments, and of course they are mouthpieces for the deputies, mainly GCS7 deputies still, who organize those meetings, and primarily Treasury, uh, Department of Treasury uh, uh, deputies uh, from the United States, uh, they said that their accomplishment since the crisis began in 2007 was that they had not allowed the crisis to lead to trade rivalries, uh, the introduction of capital controls, etc. They see that as what they've done in the context of this crisis that's been successful. A further problem uh, uh, with Marxist crisis theories has been that they have tended to see finance as merely speculative. Finance is speculative, yes. I mean, you could say even productive capital is speculative in a certain sense. But of course, finance is, is speculative. Uh, but the notion that financialization has nothing to do with the productive economy, that it has had nothing to do with the remarkable integration of global production that has taken place over the last 60 years and especially over the last 30 years, 
is, of course, wrong. Financialization has been crucially important, above all, derivative uh, in the context of uh, floating exchange rates, which is where most derivatives are located in exchange rate markets. Uh, they've been crucially important to facilitating not only the flow of capital, but the flow of trade, and even intra-firm trade, let alone inter-firm trade. They've been crucial to the outsourcing. Uh, they're crucial to Walmart's ability uh, to import from China and sell uh, goods that workers need for their reproduction at lower prices than they previously could, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that tended, that's not to say that there isn't a mountain of speculation every time that uh, international harvester goes to Goldman Sachs and says, make us an over-the-counter derivative in the exchange market, Goldman Sachs then sells that on. And there's a mountain of speculation that's built upon that one transaction. But the notion that that one transaction is not related to the quote-unquote real economy and that all of that speculation that's built upon it isn't related to it is, uh, is, is incorrect. Uh, and, and we simply uh, have been engaging in too many intellectual shortcuts on the left uh, as we try to uh, take in what has happened with financialization. And then finally, and most important, it's about time we developed a serious, I would say Marxist, theory of the state, which Marxism has always been weakest on, in relation to internationalization in relation to the internationalization of the state, by which I do not mean the creation of transnational governments, but rather the fact that, historically speaking, certain states need to take responsibility by virtue of the internationalization of their own capitalist classes and the dependence of their own economy on the transnationalization of capital. They take responsibility for doing what states do internally, internationally. They take responsibility for maintaining laws of property internationally, for changing other states so that they will respect laws of property and contract, for, above all, acting as lenders of last resort in capitalist crises, which is, of course, the central function uh, of, uh, a, capital, of a, a central bank in a capitalist state. Now, uh, how much of my time did I use up there? Most of it, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me come down then to, uh, most of it means what, five minutes left? Okay. Uh, let me come down to, you know, uh, from the generalities to the specific. Number one, uh, as we heard this morning, and, and I wish one would hear more of it, uh, the tendency that we have had to identify a Keynesian era in which finance was not an actor, and a neoliberal era in which finance was the central actor is extremely misleading. Extremely misleading. The post-war period was one, especially in this country, but not only in this country, was one in which finance was nurtured back to health under the New Deal regime and regulations, which, what it was, which is what the New Deal was designed to do, especially to nurture investment banks back to health. Uh, at the same time that labor secured the kinds of reforms that gave it a degree of industrial and social strength. The two grew together in strength. That was what socially, in class terms, the growing of the pie meant in the post-war era. And that also meant, therefore, that what Joan Robinson and Kolesky had predicted during the Second World War, which is that if you have full employment capitalism and you don't have the reserve army of labor, you remove workers' freedom from fear, and they will make demands upon their employers, whether in terms of resisting productivity increases or higher wage demands. Because, without fear that they'll put their employer out of business, because they think they can go down the street and pick up another job. There was an inflationary tendency, cost push inflation, if you had full employment capitalism. That was the central contradiction of Keynesianism. Now, when you had that at the same time, that finance was expanding and growing, both as a social force and in terms of the financialization of social life. Because you need to remember that it wasn't only, although of course it grew exponentially from the 70s on, as, as uh, we'll hear, but it wasn't only uh, uh, after the 70s that this happened. Uh, workers in terms of becoming uh, mortgagees, uh, workers in terms of winning pension rights, etc., we're already becoming part of the financialization process 
Uh, there was a, this wasn't haute finance any longer in the old sense. Uh, now, those two things came together. The strength of finance, financial capital, especially once the euro-dollar market developed, when British merchant banks switched their allegiance from sterling to the dollar after Suez. And you had a completely unregulated financial market. You had the old deal reform still there, at it with regulation to Q controlling what interest rates could be. And you, they were able to go to London and move outside of those controls. American Wall Street banks quickly became the leading players in, uh, in the city of London. The city of London was at the center of European accumulation. Uh, and, and you got these two social forces being at the core of the contradiction of Keynesianism. What inflation does to bankers, does to their calculations, does to their notion of risk, uh, et cetera, right? And the pressure coming from the working classes, which was producing inflationary tendencies in a profit squeeze. You can't go back to Keynesianism precisely because of those contradictions. It isn't a model, a set of ideas that you pick up and plonk back in place. Keynesianism fell apart because of its contradictions. And it wasn't because of the ideas of Hayek and the Mount Pelerin Society, although the German Bundesbank carried them, and carries them to this day, uh, uh, right through the 1950s. Uh, German macroeconomic policy was run as though they'd never heard of Keynes in the post-war period, despite the fact that you had a social welfare state. Uh, no, uh, Keynes is... Uh, the University of Chicago economists' ideas were powerful by 1951, when the Treasury Fed Accord was created, in which you set up a market for treasury bills, which allowed bankers to determine the limits with, of, of interest rates in the United States. And that was, that was under the influence of the University of Chicago economists in, in uh, 1950, 1951. So you had developing within the Keynesian era elements of what we now know as neoliberalization. And it reflected the fact of this growing development of these social forces in tandem. The working class side of that was massively defeated everywhere. Although until it was defeated in the United States, uh, the defeat of it elsewhere was not secured. Uh, it was attempted in 1970. Before the Volcker shock, there was an attempt to raise interest rates to 10% in 1969-70, under Nixon. Uh, two things happened. It produced, it produced an immediate commercial paper crisis uh, as, as uh, the leading banks who raised their money in uh, the American uh, financial market by issuing short-term bonds uh, in order to meet their wage bills, in order to pay off their suppliers, etc. Goldman Sachs was the main actor in this. And it could see, as soon as interest rates got raised there, that that commercial paper was not going to be turned over. We're talking here about IBM, et cetera. Uh, and, and it did what it did in this crisis. It sold off that commercial paper to universities, to municipalities, et cetera. Uh, and they were in the courts for the rest of the decade. People forget this. They were a relatively small bank at that time. And the Fed came in, lowered interest rates because it was going to cause this crisis in the productive sector. But there was another reason, and that was that the early 19, 1970 itself was the year of the greatest strike wave in the United States since 1946. Now, when 79 happened and Volcker broke the back of it, it was already in a situation in which labor was much weakened. It was under a democratic administration when labor tends to be much less militant in, in industrial terms. Uh, and it was at a time when the Fed and these organizations do learn had learned uh, that it needed to do certain things, build certain types of alliances in order to be, build the backs of inflation, beat the back of inflation through very high interest rates, which essentially reduced the amount of money in the system that facilitated the reproduction of inflation. Let me just end with this. That was followed by the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve generalizing the defeat of inflation, not being the only forces in this, but being the key forces in it, the key institutional forces, generalizing the defeat of inflation around the world. Heaven knows it didn't happen until the 1990s in many places. Much of it involved tying currencies to the American dollar. Some of that was done voluntarily, some of it was forced by the IMF. 
but the effect of it was to defeat inflation. The, the Treasury and the Fed, uh, and of course they are the determining forces behind the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, Larry Summers didn't leave being chief economist at the World Bank to become deputy secretary at the Treasury because he thought he was getting a demotion. He knew he was getting a promotion. Uh, and they played the role increasingly of firefighters. Not simply as an anti-inflation club, which they were very effective at, at the global level, but of firefighters. Because a system in which you have free movements of capital to this extent right, is one in which there are inevitably right, a series of financial fires. It's impossible not to have it, and they all know it. Greenspan said it repeatedly before the House Banking Committee. If you don't have Glass-Steagall, why do you want Fed regulatory powers? I need to know what the situation of the, bank will, the banks will be when the next crisis happens. There were 72 financial crises in the 1990s. Some, the key ones were the ones that the American Treasury and the Fed, but above all the Treasury, were at the center of being the firefighters of, what Paul O'Neill called uh, uh, firefighter-in-chief when he derided this when he became uh, Treasury Secretary under Bush in 2001. Uh, they were the key players in this, and the key role they played was not only throwing money into those, those, those crises, but the key role they played was organizing Wall Street bankers to stop the run on a given currency or a given country. That didn't mean that necessarily it was American banks who were the main lenders. In Korea in 1997, it was a meeting organized by McDonough, head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, with the key bankers in uh, uh, New York City. Uh, and and uh, they then undertook to organize amongst the European and especially the Japanese bankers who were pulling their money out of Korea, that they would stop doing so. That was key. Now, I just want to end with this. The notion that An American state, I call it an empire, which has been this central in practical terms to running the global economy. Of course, it means managing all of its contradictions. Right? And in which in this crisis has been funding, as has just been revealed on the front pages of every financial newspaper in the world, has been funding foreign banks, not only American banks, through this crisis. And as I assure you, will soon come out, is at the center of pushing the European Central Bank to buy Spanish bonds. Because if Spain goes, it'll be like Korea goes. Spain is a very large and crucial economy, and a crucial importer uh, for Germany. Germany can't maintain what it's doing if Spain can't import. The Fed lies behind getting the ECB, which is still governed by the silly Hayekian notions of the Bundesbank. I assure you, they're behind it. Now, for, to imagine that this involves a loss of hegemony in this context seems to me otherworldly. That's not to say the United States is controlling the world. That's not to say it can prevent crises. That's not to say that this crisis won't be a long one. But it is at the center by virtue of the nature of the internationalization of the economy, by virtue of the nature of the American capitalist class in that internationalized economy. The American state, insofar as one means the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, is at the center of this. Congress, of course, won't like this. There are divisions inside the American state. It remains a state of its own social formation. And the interesting thing to do is to, indeed, try to understand those tensions and contradictions inside the state. But we can finally have got to get our heads around what the American state is in global capitalism. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. What I, in concert with Benjamin Lee, present here is a long introduction to a longer book on the invisible sociality that underpins the structuring of the markets for financial derivatives. Thank you. Given the length of the paper, um, I've decided only to read the verbs <laughs> um, and have you infer the rest. <laughs>
Um, in our first book on financial derivatives, we suggested that the fulcrum year for the transformation in capitalism is 1973 and presented a set of arguments for that. Since then, the market for financial derivatives has grown from nearly nil to hundreds of trillions of dollars. In short, the market for the allocation of capital has become capital's largest market. According to the US Treasury, derivatives account for some $1.3 or $4 trillion of gross domestic product. It is important to understand that without this contribution, growth domestic product in the United States would resemble that of Japan, which incidentally has no derivatives market. So to grasp the global structure of capitalism, it is necessary to grasp the structure of circulation, which is Euro-American in genesis, but global in its implications. The character of the present conjunction, which is one in which circulation siphons off the overaccumulation of productive capital for its own speculative ends, has evolved a structure that is progressively detaching from production, yet produces reality effects that inflect the course of the real economy and the real polity. Importantly, the present relation of circulation to production is both specific to the systemic design of capitalism and capitalism at this systemic moment. One of the indices of this is the fact that the Chinese government and the Saudis don't just simply accumulate capital. They don't just simply accumulate American dollars. They actually create sovereign funds which take these dollars and reinvest them into hedge funds and proprietary trading desks, which then invest in forex, credit, mortgage, and other kinds of derivatives. So there's an intricate circulation in which the rents gained from production are rechanneled through circulation. Now, interestingly enough, the structure of the financial circulation seems to have escaped sustained academic attention. One of the ways in which this appears is that for the previous year, if one looks, for example, at the American anthropologist, there were no articles on financial derivatives. If one looks at the American Journal of Sociology, there are as many articles on fast food delivery as there are on derivatives. There seem to be a number of reasons for this. The first is that the derivative market has a directional dynamic towards complexity. The second reason is that it is highly mathematical, both in terms of the construction of its own illusio or ideology, and also in terms of the way practice is organized. This tends to dissuade an entire branch or an entire cohort of social scientists. And finally, it is really clear that production-centered state-based accounts cannot really begin to deal with circulation. Swift observed that true vision is the art of seeing the invisible. I would think that in this respect, circulatory capitalism presents something of a kind of ultimate test. Now, I come at this from a very particular sort of perspective. And that is to say that I was trained in economic anthropology and in economics here at the University of Chicago, which means at a very early time, I was introduced both to Marshall Solins um, and to Milton Friedman. Um, <laughs> One of the dimensions of this is my propensity to both read economic texts and also to do ethnographic interviews. And at this point, I have interviewed dozens of traders on various proprietary trading desks, from Goldman Sachs to the now defunct Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, about the nature of trading. I was actually brought to the problem of derivatives by my decision to do research in South Africa. 
And it was clear that the price of money, that the global markets for currency derivatives control the price of money, in this, in this case, to South African Rand, and by controlling the price of money had extraordinary implications for public policy. Incidentally, the price for release from this bondage is for Brazil, South Korea, and other nations the purchase of an extraordinary amount of US government debt. It is for this reason why, among other things, the increasing quantity of US debt has, now, has not generated an increase in US Treasury interest rates. In other words, there's an increasing demand from places like Brazil. Brazil, for example, has moved from about $17 billion of US Treasuries up to $137 billion. In this respect, of course, countries like South Africa and Brazil help subsidize mortgage and credit rates in the United States. Now, I also come at this because I was originally a mathematician long before I ever thought about anthropology. And indeed, the analysis is built in part on an understanding and a deconstruction of the mathematics underlying the efficient market theory and the pricing of derivatives. And finally, um, I trade currency, equity, and credit derivatives for my own account and therefore have some practical understanding of how they work. Now, one of the dimensions of the financial crisis is that it opened up a space. The crisis called into question the efficient market thesis that has maintained domination, I mean true supremacy, both scholastically and from the participants in the economic markets and the derivatives markets. Alan Greenspan, in his congressional testimony, 24 October 08, expressed, quote, shock disbelief that there was a flaw in his invisible hand thesis that markets are constitutionally efficient in self-correcting and therefore immune to systemic failure of the kind that had propelled the US housing and credit markets into a tailspin. Apparently, the, the visible boot of economic reality had left its imprint on the maestro. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that the efficient market theory is not simply a kind of theorization. It is something that is inherent in the work of the U.S. Federal Reserve. The U.S. Federal Reserve imposes it on other reserve banks, including, as Leo just pointed out, on Trichet and the European Union. It's also a very powerful dimension of economic theory. And it's important to understand that there are more economists and financial economists in the United States than there are every other social science profession combined, and then some. So the actual amount of symbolic and scholastic power that they wield is exceptional. Now, it's sometimes hard to appreciate that within the compass of this room where people maintain a very different perspective about the world. The crisis occurred because the circulatory processes that motivate the credit markets had become paralyzed due to what was called the evaporation of liquidity. Liquidity is more than a memorable metaphor for the flow of capital. It is financial shorthand for the market's ability to circulate capital. The, circular, the circulatory pump being both a key feature of capitalism and its lifeblood. For the indigenes of finance, liquidity is also a distilled and deeply veiled expression for the sociality of circulation, as we will see. The crisis motivated an outburst of social reflection, couched in the only language indigenous to those involved, religion. So the most hard-boiled technicians, I was tempted to say the most hard-boiled eggheads, um, melded into a kind of gooey social science speak. We have phrases from various economists and financiers that go like this, liquidity is a religion. 
Liquidity is a faith-based process. It requires, quote, that we temper our greed for the goodness of the community. It's restoration depending, according to Henry Paulson, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and Treasury Secretary, on restoring trust in the community. The irony is that, for once, in this moment of desperation, the financial community was on the right track. The crisis of theory invites other theorizations conceived on different grounds. This leads to our thesis, or the premise, that there's really no way to grasp the derivatives markets without, in, without grasping their embedded sociality, thereby rejecting the proposition that it's possible to theorize or model the economic independently of other dimensions of social life. Our aim is not to convince you that the economic is less than it seems, but that it is mounted on the shoulders of a giant sociality that it renders invisible through the very social processes that it denies existence to. In our alternative account, we conceptualize the derivatives market as the performatively constructed frame for circulations which create, even as created by, a socio-historically specific habitus of work, a habitus of work founded subjectively on a speculative ethos and objectively on speculative capital and risk-driven derivative instruments. The spine of our account is that circulation, buying and selling of by agents institute rests on socio-historically created concepts, embodied dispositions, and stances towards the world, generative schemes, layered motivations, deep-seated compulsions, as well as deep strategies of subjectivity, which constitutes the sociality of the present culture of financial circulation. Excavating this sociality requires that we grasp the sociality embodied in the agents that work within finance, that is, the work itself, the sociality inscribed in its institutions, and finally, the sociality buried in the deep structure of practice. That is to say, everything that is systematically excluded in finance economic accounts. The question then becomes, what would a critically theorized, socially visible, deeply ethnographic account of the derivatives markets look like? The question, what is a market, is neither simple nor obvious. The market is simultaneously a practical construct, a marketplace that is a site of work, and a particular kind of object constructed by economic theory. Paradoxically, market-centric views of the market lack an account of the market, because they reduce it to a naturally occurring result of the sum of individual acts of buying and selling. This view conceals the presupposition of asociality under the apparent neutrality of a straightforward empirical definition. The efficient market theory that holds supremacy is not a theory of the market. It is an asocial account of circulation, trades that set prices, that presupposes the existence of a market that is incapable of accounting for. Having discounted the social, the leap of least resistance is to bracket the market altogether, leading Nobel laureate Douglas North to observe that economics is inundated with analyses of market behavior, but not of the market itself, the construct that these analyses unconditionally presuppose. Accordingly, formal economics has no theory of the transformative structure or directional dynamic of the derivatives market. As an economist at Goldman Sachs put it to me, securitization just is. Okay? Um, now, in our version, we understand the market as a socially imagined totality. The problematic is where does the market come from? How is it produced and reproduced? The question is essential because markets are social inventions and because financial actions take place within a frame of their own design. How does the financial field produce and reproduce collective agents, such as a credit derivatives market, or a mortgage market, or a merger acquisition market? At issue is how agents produce the social totality that produces them. That is a system of relations and properties sustained by the collective genesis and implications of their actions. Our argument is the market as a totality is an ontologically, ontologically real social fiction that agents quasi-automatically produce through the force of collective beliefs and the instantiation of their practices. 
Read socially, the evidence shows that markets are founded on the embedded processes by and through which agents objectify the market totality that they participate in by virtue of their participation in them. More, that these participants objectify themselves collectively through the reproduction of an imaginary frame, such as a derivative market, which then appears to them as an independent reality which stands apart from them and exerts an impersonal determination over them. From our perspective, and this unfolds in the course of the account, it is the interrelationship between performativity and objectification that produces and stabilizes the market as a totality. From our perspective, the market is created performatively by what we might call as a secular ritualization of financial life, which links existential events, like executing a trade, to the totality that is the market. Seeing this connectivity requires recognition that events can possess the properties and produce the effects of ritual without ever being expressly so. Thus understood, rituals are enhanced, transparent versions of a more general event quality of rituality present in any social practice. This rituality allows social practices to posit what they effectuate. In this way, rituality creates a performative impulse in which the participants presuppose the realness of the social totality that the event helps the creator effect or effectuate by assuming that this event, here and now, is essentially a replica of previous event performances. The performativity of the practice is central because it shapes the illusion that the totality created socially is a naturally occurring object. The event summons the participants to believe, to have faith, the totality indexically presupposed by this specific event is as real as the existential lived event itself. There is a cognitive and dispositional obligation to presume that the efficient market is as real as the trade that I have just made efficiently. By this means, the specific trade figurates what it and all of the trades classified as like it collectively effectuate. The capacity and dispositions of agents to collectively ascribe to the same understanding of the market without any collective intention to do so, does not just occur. It depends on socializing agents through their immersion in the distinctive habitus of the financial field and the hard work of, the, of its institutions as exemplified by the full bore initiation training of recruits. Just so that you understand this, when someone would go to work for Bear Stearns, they would be expected to work 70 hours a week and to sleep at least three nights a week at the Bear Stearns office. Through this process, they would basically then select a certain group of candidates. In a way, they would select the candidates. In a way, the candidates would work, would participate by virtue of their dispositions being tailored to or appropriate to being part of that kind of financial institution. And the understanding was that of every 100 recruits that they would take, no more than 10 or 12 would eventually be initiated into Bear Stearns. This process would last somewhere close to a year. Or to put this another way, the entire process of, becoming, of being integrated into the Bear Stearns trading department was a very complex, modern kind of initiation in which your habitus was tailored, <coughs> your own personal habitus was tailored to the habitus of trading. Okay. Um, the confluence of the real and the fictional through the power of collective circulated belief, as well as agents' faith in totality they have instantiated, highlights this performative aspect. They are defined by a dialectic between rights of self-objectification, large and small and most of all continuous, and the production of a financial habitus that indoctrinates agents to have faith in the market's integrity. That agents objectify liquidity as the normal state of the financial markets goes hand in hand with, a, with an ensemble of concepts and dispositions that normalize their collective faith in the totality. Liquidity is the finance, financial field's representation of sociality objectified in the notion of the counterparty and the risk posed by those on the other sides of the trade. There is a constant interplay between the objectification of abstract risk via that mathematical modeling and through agents' attempts to discern what others with similar models and habitus are doing. <coughs> 
The totality constructs itself in an interplay between overlapping models and the iteration of the models that agents share and attribute to other players in the market. Thus, the market as a totality lies at the intersection of specific real-time trades and the imaginary community constructed out of everyone's belief in and faith in what others are doing with respect to similar trades and deals, such as assembling and marketing collateralized debt obligations. The result is that the market appears as the aggregation of individual trades, even though agents' ability to consummate those individual trades presupposes in terms on a faith-based liquidity whose social foundational properties are effaced by that process of objectification. Okay. Um, that's the end. <laughs> okay. Um, there, um, there was one other aspect that I would actually um, like to um, underline. Um, and that is to say that paradoxically, for the financial agents and institutions, the more successful the inculcation of this very specific social habitus, the more the agents share an ensemble of, that ensemble of standpoints, generative schemes, dispositions, then the more the social is obscured from their field of vision. At issue, of course, here is what kind of social is it that does not appear so from the insider's inside perspective. Now, it's important to point out, and I'll end on this, that the efficient market theory, or what I call the illusio, is actually created by the imbrication of the lamination of three different types of ideologies. The first ideology is the market is closed and complete. And this, in, this is incorporated or instilled in the kind of mathematical formula that are actually used to understand the market. The second dimension of the Illusio, of course, is that in fact the agents involved are rational. Though interestingly enough, when agents are interviewed about the trades that they make, it turns out that economic rationality oftentimes does not play anywhere near a central role. In fact, frequently, the trades are understood as competitive encounters where the goal is, in fact, to best those who you're in, who you're in um, conflict with. It's been repeated to me over and over again that a trade of a similar dollar amount in which you best Goldman Sachs is far, far better than, a sim than this trade of the same dollar amount in which, you best, in, which in fact, you best a lower entity, okay? In other words, it has nothing to do with it. There is also, in fact, in this, um, interestingly enough, um, other kinds of, of understandings that are, um, that are absolutely um, fascinating. First, um, one of the things that motivates people is, is what they consider to be this carnival of possibilities that is open to them in constructing the derivative deal. And the idea that there is this carnival of possibilities is understood to be extraordinarily seductive. Another dimension is this kind of like seduction of risk, um, especially the idea that you, in fact, risk a bet in which you can lose substantially. One of the ironies of the process is that traders frequently try not to minimize risk, but to amplify risk. And the idea is not only to win more in terms of money, but in fact to indicate that you have a certain level of gumption, a certain level of balls, okay? Um, that you can in fact have the intelligence and the balls to actually make the trade, okay? And I should add that the language that I just used is what is continually said. People will continually say what he has is the brains and the balls to trade, okay? If I heard it once, I heard it 50 times, okay? Another interesting dimension of this is that there is also a certain sort that they express, a certain sort of dark pleasure of what they understand to be ethical transgression. So when someone tells me that they don't care what happens if they make a particular trade and people lose their houses, and they say it with a certain amount of relish and a certain amount of pleasure that is gained out of this kind of ethical transgression. This itself, of course, is something which is deeply instilled in the kind of habitus that the various institutions, no matter what their publicity says, 
um, actually inculcates in their agents. I could go on to a much more detailed account of the actual motivational structure of trading, but suffice it to say that the notion that is popularized as greed doesn't begin to cover it. It's sort of like describing the Venus de Milo as a double amputee. <laughs> okay? um, it's not descriptively wrong, but it hardly, it hardly gets to the essence of the matter. Okay? Okay, with that, I'll, I'll leave it. Just um, add my thanks uh, to the uh, organizer of the, of the conference. I've been to um, a number of meetings on the financial crisis, but I think none as diverse and stimulating as this one. So thanks uh, for, for putting this together and for uh, inviting me. Perhaps. The financial crisis has held uh, no shortage, shortage of surprises for students of US political economy. A short list would include the sudden extinction of the investment bank, the near nationalization of the US financial system, and the rapid transmission of a financial panic that at first appeared confined to US mortgage markets to the global economic system. But more surprising than the remarkable events that have occurred since US mortgage markets began to implode over three years ago is an event that has not occurred. Given the scope of the financial crisis and its devastating implications for American households facing foreclosure, job losses, restricted credit access, and other hardships, we might expect widespread social protest. But while there, have been, but, but while there has been much talk of brewing public anger over Wall Street excesses and the staggering cost of the financial bailout, this popular anger seems more staged to summon support for financial reform than it does a reflection of a genuine popular politics. In short, with the notable exception of the Tea Party movement, the political response to the crisis appears anemic. The puzzle deepens when we observe that uh, the financial crisis aside, issues of credit and finance have been almost entirely absent from uh, politics over the last several decades. And this is especially noteworthy considering that finance has become increasingly important in our society in the years since the 1970s with the size of the financial sector ballooning relative to the rest of the economy. Indeed, other comparable periods, such as the late 19th century Gilded Age, spawned vigorous social movements that contested the money power of finance capital. But notably, the second Gilded Age, as numerous scholars have come to refer to the decades since the 1970s, has not generated a Gilded Age politics. So in my paper, uh, I explore this apparent anomaly by asking, why isn't there a more vigorous politics around finance and particularly around credit in late 20th and early 21st century America? Now, of course, there are well-known uh, methodological difficulties associating, associated with studying the absence of a given phenomena. <coughs> Absences can only, be, can only be made sense of if there are also presences that throw the contours of the elusive non-event into relief. In the case at hand, we are aided by the fact that the 1970s witnessed the beginnings of an incipient credit politics. And in this regard, while it's not possible to directly examine the absence of a credit politics in the decades since the 1970s, it is possible to trace the divergent histories of movements that might have provided the basis for such, uh, that might have provided the basis for such a politics in the immediately preceding period. Understanding why these movements trailed off or why, in rarer instances, they proved more sustainable can help us to, to help us to discern the shape of what is otherwise unobservable. So in the following uh, analysis, I examine the divergent trajectories of two movements that politicized credit in the 1970s. Uh, feminist mobilization to end gender discrimination in credit markets, representing the typical case of a movement that did not persist beyond the end of the 1970s, and the struggle of community reinvestment activists against the redlining of urban neighborhoods representing the rare case of credit activism that has remained viable into the present. In order to account for the differences between these two cases, 
I hypothesize uh, two conditions that are necessary in order for credit to become a carrier of politics. A shared experience of vulnerability in credit markets and a conception of citizenship capable of making that experience both visible and politically actionable. I argue that while both movements were organized around the experience of exclusion from markets, only the community reinvestment uh, movement joined the shared experience to a notion of citizenship that facilitated politi political action in the period following the 1970s. So turning uh, to the first of these two cases, uh, feminist mobilization to end uh, credit discrimination emerged in the early 1970s in response to widespread evidence that women were encountering serious difficulties in obtaining credit. Single women uh, typically fared best in credit markets, although many otherwise qualified single borrowers were denied mortgage loans because it was assumed that they did not have the requisite skills to maintain a property. Married women typically could not obtain a credit card without a husband's signature or qualify for a loan without the husband as co-signer. These difficulties were compounded in the case of mortgage credit, where the standard, present, uh, the standard practice was to discount a wife's income if she was of childbearing age on the assumption that the wife would soon withdraw from the labor market. Sometimes lenders would relax these restrictions if the couple provided what was called a pill letter, describing their birth control practices and indicating that they intended to abort if the woman became pregnant. When a marriage dissolved through separation, divorce, or death, creditors would typically revoke a woman's credit cards. Moreover, because these cards had been issued in the name of the husband, newly separated, divorced, and widowed women discovered that they had not accumulated a credit history and therefore faced additional obstacles in qualifying for credit. In response to these various obstacles, the National Organization of Women now uh, formed its National Credit Task Force in 1972. The task force successfully lobbied for passage of an anti-discrimination statute, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, which was signed into law in 1974. The law prohibited uh, creditors from taking sex or marital status into consideration in making credit decisions. The most controversial provision of the new law was a requirement that creditors notify applicants who had been denied credit of the reasons for uh, the adverse decision. Now argued that without such notification, few women would realize that they had been victims of credit discrimination. Creditors worried, conversely, that providing the reasons for denial to rejected applicants would result in costly lawsuits. Now prevailed in persuading regulators that notification was essential. But creditors' response to the requirement undermined enforcement of the new law. In particular, the notification requirement precipitate, precipitated a wholesale shift in the industry toward the practice of credit scoring. Uh, credit scoring is a technique that uses statistical analysis to assign points to various attributes of applicants in order to discriminate between good and bad credit risks. Creditors preferred this method of screening applicants for consumer credit because it appeared scientific and objective. Equally important, though, was the manner in which credit scoring scrambled socially meaningful group identities. As one observer explained, scoring has as a premise that any individual is not a member of a class definable by a single characteristic, but rather is a member of a number of subgroups in society. The number of subgroups created by credit scoring was vast indeed. The smallest number of possible combination in Montgomery Ward's proprietary scoring system, for example, was a mind-boggling 750,000. The implication was clear. Rather than credit being denied to women as a class, it was denied to individuals whose identities had been sliced and diced into minuscule pieces. Length of time in current employment, type of occupation, telephone and house, rent, owned home, and so on. Moreover, since the contribution of each such attribute to the index's predictive power depended on the value of the other variables scored, no single attribute was meaningful by itself. As a corporate credit manager for Montgomery Ward explained, only the aggregate of the single score weights is usable. No legitimate inference can be made about a single score taken out of context. In other words, no single characteristic will permit an approval nor cause a, a rejection for credit extension to the applicant. No single coherent identity characterized those denied credit, and no single isolated characteristic could be identified as the cause for denial. The result of credit scoring was to first disaggregate social identities constitutive of political action, 
and then recombine the resulting fragments into a lifeless statistical aggregate. As creditors remedy the most egregious forms of credit discrimination following the passage of the new law, more subtle and pervasive forms of discrimination vanished into complex credit scoring algorithms. Of course, credit scoring did not completely mask women's continuing disadvantage in credit markets. Now activists were well aware that many of the characteristics commonly scored by creditors were strongly correlated with gender. And in this sense, credit scoring merely substituted proxy variables for protected classes that could not be scored directly. In fact, the issue posed a stark dilemma for feminists. If the items uh, commonly scored by creditors and correlated with gender, such as occupation, length of time with current employer, home ownership, and income, accurately reflected the economic standing of the prospective borrower, was it then discriminatory to base credit decisions on them? As creditors were fond of pointing out, the word discrimination had a dual meaning. In its most common usage, to discriminate meant to unfairly exclude an individual from access to some social good on the basis of an arbitrary, typically ascriptive, ascriptive characteristic, most commonly race or gender. For creditors, in contrast, discrimination was hardly a pejorative term. It referred to the necessary, even noble process of sifting through good and bad credit risks. Discussions about women's credit worthiness were caught between both meanings of the term. From one perspective, these items almost certainly conveyed information about creditworthiness, and hence any responsible lender had to take them into consideration. From another perspective, as long as women were encumbered by cumulative disadvantages in credit and other markets, relying on such information served to perpetuate past discrimination. Initially now held the position that it would be inappropriate to hold, credit, uh, to hold creditors responsible for the, the inequities of the world at large. But by the late 1970s, now appeared to be reconsidering this position. In the context of the struggle for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, now prepared a memo lamenting the inability of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to touch the broader inequities that made the statute less effective in improving women's position in credit markets than feminists had hoped. The availability of credit, the memo noted, is largely dependent on a person's income. Although the law prohibited a creditor from requiring a higher income from a woman than a man in order to qualify for credit, women were segregated into low-income jobs, tended to do more part-time work, and received less pay even when performing the same job as their male counterparts. In these circumstances now observed, women will find it difficult to meet the income standards of many creditors. While the purpose of the memo was clearly to suggest that the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was by itself insufficient, and that only passage of the Equal Rights Amendment would place a firm foundation beneath women's credit rights, the memo also pointed to deeper tensions in the quest for credit access. In order to answer creditors' arguments that women simply were not creditworthy, feminists required an alternative conception of economic citizenship that moved beyond a narrow discrimination frame to consider more substantive claims for full inclusion in the marketplace. This would require decoupling the market position of women calibrated by their credit worthiness from their ability to gain access to credit. And there are indications that feminists were beginning to think about credit as a basic right of citizenship, but nevertheless now failed to fully embrace this conception, perhaps because it represented too great a break with the organization's traditional emphasis on formal legal rights, or because, uh, because the broader political environment was becoming decidedly less favorable to expansive notions of economic citizenship in the 1970s. But whatever the reason, without a reframing of the problem of credit access, women's shared experience of exclusion from credit markets was neither visible nor politically actionable. The mantle of credit activism would pass elsewhere. The movement for community reinvestment provides a striking counterpoint to the experience of feminist activists seeking to broaden women's access to credit. The community reinvestment uh, movement emerged in the early 1970s in response to the redlining of urban neighborhoods. Redlining, uh, as most of you will know, refers to the practice of denying loans to otherwise creditworthy individuals solely because of characteristics of the neighborhoods in which they reside, typically racial composition. For decades, real estate appraisal practices had been premised on the principle that there was no greater threat to property values than a neighborhood in transition from one ethnic uh, or racial group to another. As a result, once blacks had moved into a white neighborhood, lenders withdrew financing from the areas they now considered too risky. 
Black and white residents alike found themselves unable to secure conventional financing to obtain a mortgage, a home improvement loan, or business credit. Without access to credit, the appraiser's projection of declining property values quickly became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Urban residents in cities across the country observed the rapid deterioration of their communities in the 1960s and 1970s. Over the same years, anecdotal evidence that urban neighborhoods were being shut out of credit markets was accumulating. But without systematic data showing where, uh, where financial institutions took deposits and made loans, these impressions would be haphazard and could not support an organized response on the part of urban residents. Community activists therefore began to press for disclosure of data revealing financial institutions' lending activities by location. Following a protracted struggle, local activists in Chicago succeeded in persuading financial regulators to conduct a survey collecting these data, which confirmed what neighborhood activists had long suspected. Chicago's urban neighborhoods received 10% of the loans, but accounted for 28% of the deposits, with some Chicago neighborhoods receiving as little as four cents per dollar in savings uh, four, four cents per dollar of savings in new loans. The Chicago survey was instrumental in securing passage in 1975 of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. This was a federal law that required lending institutions to, to disclose the number and total dollar amount of mortgage loans by location. But while mandatory disclosure represented a significant victory for the reinvestment movement, the law contained no mechanism for remedying irregularities in the distribution of credit identified by the data collected under its provisions. The Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 addressed this deficiency by requiring regulators to consider a financial institution's performance in, in meeting community credit needs when deciding on bank applications to branch or merge. The law was weakly enforced, but a provision in the law that allowed community groups to, to protest bank applications gave these groups important leverage in negotiating side agreements with financial institutions that committed them to housing and business lending in local communities. Critically, the law also provided a platform for ongoing activism around community reinvestment. While the temper of activism has cooled since the 1970s, the reinvestment movement has remained viable, with some 800, 800 community organizations active nationally as of 2003. Now, how can we understand uh, that outcome against the very different experience of feminist credit activism? Uh, first, both, both feminist and reinvestment activists understood that disclosure would be critical to enforcing anti-discrimination legislation, but only the form of disclosure uh, sought by reinvestment activists allowed victims to clearly perceive credit discrimination. Feminists place great uh, emphasis on the requirement that creditors disclose reasons for adverse decisions so that women would know when discrimination had occurred against them. But this strategy, this strategy depended on individual women being able to link those reasons back to a collective social identity that could be mobilized for purposes of political action, a strategy neutralized by the practice of credit scoring. In contrast, reinvestment advocates were reluctant to rely on individual realizations of discrimination. This reflected the fact that redlining affected communities, not individuals. Reinvestment activists therefore insisted on disclosure at the level of the community, where credit discrimination left a visible mark even when credit scoring was extended to mortgage lending in the 1990s. Second, uh, while the feminist movement foundered on its inability to move beyond a narrow discrimination frame in conceptualizing women's credit rights, reinvestment activists avoided the concept of discrimination altogether. Although redlining, of course, refers to a form of geographic discrimination, reinvestment activists tended to use the term as a synonym for disinvestment to refer to the process where financial institutions accepted deposits from one neighborhood and invested them in loans made in other areas. The difference may seem uh, purely semantic, but in fact it had profound consequences for the politicization of credit. As overt forms of discrimination were eliminated from mortgage markets, Following passage of anti-discrimination laws, creditors staged a counter-offensive, arguing that taking location into consideration in lending decisions was in many cases legitimate business practice. Unfortunately, there is a relationship between high unemployment and less stability and in income and in minority areas, one savings and loan president observed. But SNLs didn't create that situation. 
a financial industry lobbyist compared uh, anti-redlining regulations to a regulation prohibiting you from considering the model year of a car when you're making an automobile loan. Against such notions, financial institutions pleaded with the public to remember that they were businesses, not social welfare organizations. Feminist activists had become mired down in precisely such arguments, and they grudgingly conceded that creditors could not be held responsible for the broader social inequities that contributed to women's disadvantaged position in credit markets. The language of disinvestment sidestepped these arguments. It was not a matter of the creditworthiness of urban neighborhoods. To be sure, reinvestment activists argued vociferously that the vast majority of individuals in, in urban areas denied loans were creditworthy, and no one was suggesting that financial institutions be forced to make unsound loans. But this was not the point. The point was that resources that belonged to the community were being siphoned out of the, were being extracted from the community and siphoned into other areas. As one reinvestment activist explained, when we first started, people didn't understand how we could get a savings and loan association to do anything, since they thought that once they put their money in, it became the institution's money. Now people are beginning to think of their deposits as their own money. In short, reinvestment activists were not asserting that all individuals have a basic right to credit as a prerequisite for participation in a market economy. Rather, the claim was one of ownership. Reinvestment activists demanded full control over resources that rightfully belonged to them. In this manner, reinvestment activists subverted the banker's refrain that they had a fiduciary responsibility to protect depositors' investments and therefore could not perform social welfare functions. Neighborhood residents were the depositors, and they were not asking for welfare, but merely demanding that their money be used in service of their communities. So while these two cases are, uh, I think, only suggestive, they provide uh, two important clues to understanding the general absence of a politics around uh, credit and finance in contemporary U.S. society. First, uh, transformations in credit markets since the 1970s have made it increasingly difficult for individuals to perceive experiences of vulnerability in markets as shared with others similarly positioned to themselves. While I discussed the manner in which the practice of credit scoring obscured collective experiences of exclusion from markets, <laughs> equally important is the closely related shift from discrimination on the basis of access to credit to discrimination on the, on the basis of the price of credit and other loan terms. Refusing a transaction in an absolute sense is much more salient politically than sifting individuals through a tiered risk structure in which they may have access to credit as long as they are willing to meet the price. Second, uh, conceptions of economic citizenship that encompass claims for, for, for full inclusion in the marketplace organized around a basic right to credit have generally proven less resonant than claims based on the ownership of financial assets. While the ownership frame is very powerful, in part because it aligns with the tectonic shift uh, from state to market underway in our society since the 1970s, it necessarily offers a narrower basis for mobilizing credit activism. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really want to be here. Um, the <laughs> quarter is over and I have a research trip that I was going to go on beginning today and, uh, you know, my friend Moish um, persuaded me that um, it's really more important to go to his conference and be on his panel and I, I have to say I'm really glad that I did because on the first day um, I got to see some of the most leading uh, materialist Marxist theorists of the last century uh, leave us with a recurrent trope about spirituality, the spirit of God, <laughs> the spirit of uh, Porto Alegre. I think that's, that's just incredibly fascinating. And then I also get to uh, comment on these incredibly good papers. The papers are, are really spectacular. I think there should be a, a, a website where you can download these papers. But in any case, thank you very much, Moish for making me uh, rebuild my plans. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these were very fascinating and uh, nicely crafted papers. Uh, all three are uh, well worth reading, and they're, uh, they're rich empirically and uh, very strong conceptually. The, um, the papers make um, uh, 
they both make and uh, revolve around uh, three claims, <coughs> main claims. Uh, one, actors in the financial sector misrecognize their own sociality. Not only are social relations understood to be relations between things, often increasingly very abstract things, but the highly constructed arenas in which those things are exchanged are understood to be natural and spontaneously emergent entities. Um, two, uh, financialization has overtaken U.S. capitalism, uh, if not global capitalism. This is not merely a claim about the relentless and disproportionate growth of the financial sector within the GDPs of major uh, economies. It is also a claim about pervasive and insidious commodification of ever more economic, social, and political relations that is driven by the spread of financialization. Finance needs to count and calculate, so people and their relations need to be fashioned in ways that permit that. Property is the privileged idiom for citizenship. Firms have become nexes of uh, contracts. Supply chains have been modulized, modularized to facilitate plug and play off shoring kinds of uh, uh, strategies, et cetera. This has, as um, the Krippner paper um, really nicely shows, uh, perverse and worrisome consequences for the way that citizenship is increasingly understood and for the possibilities for mass politics of resistance in the United States in particular. And then three, third claim. Um, the, the current financial crisis is a crisis of global capitalism. As such, it both reveals the scope of U.S. hegemony in the global economy and the relative power of financial capital in the manner in which the hegemon reconnoiters in its efforts to repair imbalances and can construct new governance arrangements. So I, I believe that there is you know, much truth in, in each of these claims, but I, I am going to suggest here um, a lot in the manner of the um, morning's panel, uh, the two really good papers from the morning's panel, uh, that, in, that each of the three claims is in many ways overdrawn. Uh, in this comment, I want to cast some doubt on each, and, or at least in any case, uh, introduce complexity. Uh, sometimes the recognition of complexity can be a lever for the recognition of greater possibility. Um, so, regarding the first claim, actors in the financial sector misrecognize their own sociability. Le Puma and Lee use the very promising language of performativity and negative performativity as a way to capture the manner in which the word becomes flesh in the realm of finance. A social, uh, non-social, not social, theoretical conceptions of atomized individuals and natural markets both emerge from and help to define the self-understandings of actors within the, that realm and, most importantly, drive the dynamics of action within the realm. In particular, Le Puma and Lee suggest that this social arrangement creates a particular kind of faith in the logic of social life, uh, a particular kind of faith in the logic of social life. Agents value self-sacrifice and the pursuit of self-interest, and they believe that the realms in which they do this, markets, are naturally emergent and spontaneously self-correcting and self-governing. This is a sort of deification of the price system. Uh, naturally emergent prices semiotically reveal pathways for proper action to those who have faith in their truth. I agree with this as a characterization of certain strands within the contemporary economic, within contemporary economic theory, and uh, do not doubt that there is, in, there is that in some part of themselves, actors in the finance sector believe this. But I don't think that they think this in every part of themselves. In particular, I think that the performativity perspective has a difficult time understanding the dynamics of market making and of innovation that are pervasive within the financial sector and which increasingly drive the way that actors in many industries outside of finance engage uh, with their surroundings. Innovation in financial technology and financial products over the last 30 years has been driven by the understanding that the greatest gains in value and profit are to be had not through the optimization of strategies within given markets, but rather through the construction of new instruments, new products, uh, that create new markets. Um, the phenomenon of sec securitization and all of the instruments associated with CDOs, uh, lots of these acronyms, uh, <coughs> with its spread is all about the creation of new markets, selling new stuff in new ways and being the first one to do so, um, so that you can reap uh, a monopoly profit. This is a highly constructivist, not at all naturalized understanding of innovation and market making. Moreover, it has, that is, actors are very self-conscious about making markets with their products. Moreover, <clears throat> it has produced specific kinds of sociability and very interesting forms of organizational practice and governance within and between financial firms. 
Securities firms and investment banks are not pillars of lone wolf investors with minion gophers doing the paperwork and isolated engineers doing calculations in front of computer screens. Rather, they are continuously self-recomposing conjuries of proje project teams and multifunctional offices people by members of their own organization, as well as lawyers, accountants, and financial experts from other organizations. Such organizational forms have um, very little to do with contract. That is, they are very uh, uh, tacitly collaborative uh, in many ways, and informally collaborative in many ways, and are very self-consciously designed to generate disruption of uh, habit, uh, <clears throat> to create new ways of thinking about value creation. Through the, social encounter, through the social encounter in the process of financial production itself of actors with very different specialized roles, banker, lawyer, physicist. Physicists are usually the makers of the complex equations. They're not economists. Um, uh, bean counters, et cetera, accountants. The, the taken for granted understandings of the world that each carries into the encounter are disrupted. They each have habits taken for granted, and those habits and taken for granted are disrupted and made explicit through the, through the encounter. The very self-conscious and systematically organized hope here is that such encounters lead to new ways of viewing the range of possibilities. Banks, like many other contemporary capitalist organizations, such as, you know, for example, in Silicon Valley or even in uh, prosaic manufacturing supply chains, uh, have cultivated the collaborative, recompositional, and decidedly non-market-based forms of sociability described here in an effort to make new markets and capture greater amounts of value. So the point, um, rather than the erasure of the social, at least in the most innovative realms of financial practice, actors have systematically created arrangements that are self-consciously social and interacted, interactive, even uh, to the actors themselves. They're aware of this. <clears throat> Moreover, the arrangements are designed to interrogate their own taken-for-granted practices, making the tacit explicit uh, creates the possibility for transformation. The language of performativity doesn't really uh, capture these dynamics of innovation and market making uh, that drive practice in contemporary finance. <clears throat> so, uh, regarding the second claim, um, that financialization has overtaken US capitalism, here I think there is much truth to the claim, but that it is overdrawn. Um, I'm from New Jersey, guy from New Jersey. I like um, completely stupid uh, phrases, so you know it throws the baby out with the uh, uh, bathwater. <laughs> There are still other uh, substantial realms of value creation contributing to GDP uh, in the United States. The production of aerospace and military technology, for example, big deal in the United States. The provision of healthcare, entertainment, and even many, many forms of manufacturing. Embattled as some of its firms are, the US uh, is still the world's largest producer of automobiles. Um, more auto automobiles are produced in the US than in any other market. Uh, it is the world's third largest producer of steel, a completely non-outsourceable product. Um, uh, the world's largest producer of construction machinery and uh, farm equipment, uh, et cetera. Uh, indeed, in an absolute sense, that is just raw numbers compared to other raw numbers, uh, the US remains the world's largest manufacturing nation. Uh, these forms of practice are increasingly dwarfed internally by finance and other services, but they are not trivial forms of value creation. Outsiders have noticed this. Uh, for most of the first decade of this, of this current 21st century, the US was the world's number one uh, destination for foreign direct investment in manufacturing. Uh, foreign companies want to manufacture things here in the United States. Um, to be sure, the financial sector has ballooned in a frankly grotesque and pathological fashion in the United States and Britain uh, since the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions. I agree with a lot of the narrative. Um, but it is still a fraction within the capitalist class, to use an idiom that I usually try to uh, uh, ignore or, or stay away from. I, I you know, agonistically, Moish and I uh, have nice conversations about these things. And uh, <clears throat> moreover, these other sectors very often resist the efforts of the financial sector to, uh, they resist the efforts of the uh, uh, financial sector to redefine and discipline them through the imposition of their own self-serving categories. For example, there has been heated battle in the courts over the last 30 years about the question of what a firm is. Um, that is, should it be understood merely as a nexus of contracts composed for the benefit of the shareholder investors that own it? Or should a firm be, uh, uh, or should, uh, oh, 
Or should a firm or corporation be understood to be an entity controlled by managers who have a series of responsibilities not only, only to shareholders, but to other stakeholders, such as employees, pensioners, and the communities in which the firms are located? Um, financial interests have scandalously and crassly pushed the shareholder value view through uh, uh, agents like private equity uh, 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 holders. Um, uh, but the courts have not consistently rewarded them. Uh, mergers and acquisitions in the U.S. are highly political and uh, legalized processes that systematically incorporate stakeholder interests. The stakeholders don't always win, but they by no means always lose in these battles. Uh, the um, <coughs> bankruptcy proceedings, um, which has restructured uh, the steel industry in the United States in a, a, an incredibly successful way in the last 15 years, uh, is constituted in, in the same way. Um, the GM bailout was uh, not kind to the shareholders uh, and systematically incorporated stakeholder interest in the redefinition of the, of the firm. So again, the point here is not to suggest that finance is irrelevant and that the insidious commodification of life in the, in the US and globally through the ascendance of the neoliberal imaginary is a fiction. That's not, the, that's not my interest. Uh, the point is only to suggest that it is not uncontested, uh, even in the US, and that the picture is quite complicated. Uh, possibilities for political action and more, uh, that political resources within the traditional discourses of citizenship and political obligation in the US are still available for progressive politics. The whale of Fox News and the Tea Party in many ways obscures the quite different sets of categories that structure negotiation and conflict in the local trenches uh, of American life. Um, so on the third claim, that the uh, current crisis is a crisis of global capitalism, uh, my view is that this depends on what uh, one means by global capitalism or by um, global crisis or by global capitalist crisis. You know, even if you just look at yesterday's um, uh, discussion, it's kind of ay, 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 not clear. But um, uh, at the moment, as many noted yesterday and today, um, China, South Korea, and even Germany today are enjoying renewed growth and employment, while stagnation is concentrated in the US, Britain, and the peripheral states within the Eurozone. Uh, some capitalisms are no longer in crisis, at least on, according to some understandings of what crisis is. Uh, while others undeniably still are. My time is short and this topic is very large, so I will just make two points. First, uh, the real crisis today, um, two years after the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, is not a crisis that derives from toxic assets and rapacious fin financiers irresponsibly destabilizing global accounts by pushing bogus strategies of securitization. It is a crisis that derives from the chronic international imbalances in trade and money flows between surplus countries, China, Germany, South Korea, Taiwan, and deficit countries such as the United States, Britain, and the peripheral European Union countries such as Portugal, Greece, Ireland, uh, and Spain. I mean, you can complicate the, the groupings. Um, the next 20 years will involve an incredibly painful and highly politicized process of restructuring at both international and national levels uh, in which the surplus players, China, Germany, etc., uh, will have to spend more, and the deficit players will have to spend less and, and make more. Uh, the financial bubble associated with neoliberalism in many ways helped produce these imbalances, uh, but the bubble also staved off and obscured the seriousness of the underlying international realignment that we now confront uh, uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the subprime mortgage excesses. Um, so the second point within this third uh, discussion. Um, the reform of the financial sector in these processes of alignment will be differently involved and carry very different kinds of weight in different regions uh, and national political economies. For example, in Germany and China, places that um, drank the neoliberal Kool-Aid in a much less uh, potent uh, manner than was the case in the United States and uh, Britain. Their adjustment will have to involve a shift of resources away from ex export dependence and toward either greater reliance on, on services, probably in the German case, or more production for the domestic market. Um, China. While in the U.S. and Britain, reasonable reform, reasonable reform should reduce the level of personal debt in particular and the weight of financial value creation in general uh, within the economy. 
the U.S. should shift to the production of value by other means, e.g., among other things, by uh, manufacturing more. They have a lot of manufacturing. They can manufacture more. Or it will deal with the prospect, if they don't do this, it will deal with the prospect, the U.S. and Britain will deal with the prospect of long-term secular decline as a uh, global economic power, as a power within the global economy. Um, so American hegemony, yay or nay, um, <clears throat> it is very unclear uh, that financialization, uh, that is the imaginary of liber neoliberalism, can come up with a strategy to uh, restabilize itself in, or replicate itself, or restabilize itself in the, in the form in which it has existed uh, up to now. Uh, so if progressive forces want to avoid the latter outcome, which is a, a you know, secular decline, progressive, progressive forces in the United States and in the developed countries, if they want to avoid secular decline, uh, which will involve spectacular immiseration, uh, then they can only benefit from understanding the logic and scope of financialization in the U.S. that the three different papers in this panel uh, present. Uh, but they will also need to recover and transform political resources and traditions in the society that these analyses have tended to blend out of you. So, thank you. Uh, I'll just ask that people keep their questions a bit short. And if you have a, just a comment, that's fine, but don't bother pivoting the question and just to save time. So, um. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for, first of all, I'd like to echo Gary's comments that this was a spectacularly good panel, and I would add that your comments uh, contributed to the, uh, the quality further. Uh, what I'd actually like to do is to uh, ask Edward and Greta questions about papers they didn't write. Uh, and it, I enjoyed the papers you did write, but I still have these questions. Uh, in the case of Edward, I didn't hear that much about crisis. That is to say, how is the habitus of these traders uh, affected when liquidity evaporates? Is it impervious to that? Uh, change? Does it shift? Does it, uh, how does it defend itself? And so I just like to have the, the, the crisis element of, of your really fascinating and, and illuminating analysis. And on, in Greta's case, um, you start with the assumption that the current Gilded Age has not generated social protest. What if you change that assumption and assume uh, that the Tea Party movement is that protest. And in that case, I assume you've looked at the protests in the earlier Gilded Age, and I'm wondering whether the Tea Party movement bears any resemblance to those earlier protests, and if so, or if not, whether we can learn anything about the Tea Party movement from that comparison. Thanks. Why don't we gather a couple more questions so we can consolidate them. So. Um, in the commentary, uh, you talked about uh, financial institutions as value creating, and I wonder if uh, what theory of value you're operating with uh, uh, in that context, uh, if, if uh, making money is the same thing as creating value. Uh, I think uh, the whole question uh, of uh, the value theory uh, may, may need to be Re-examined. Also, I mean, the, the, the point uh, made in the first uh, talk about the connection between financial institutions and the so-called real economy. Uh, does what implications, if that, if any, does that have for value thinking? There's a great, in volume one of Capital, there's a great little uh, passage where Marx says something about it's more about value theory. It's more convenient not to have any theory about it at all. Final question? Yeah, it's primarily a question for Leo, but anyone who would be willing could comment. Uh, if I understand your argument, and I think I do, and I think it's right, uh, the basic problem with the current financial crisis is the weakness of labor, the fact that basically the economy has been growing, you know, ever since the end of the Second World War, but wages went flat. And, it, and so it looked like you're going to have a, 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 you know, 
an underconsumption problem, okay, in classical Marxian terms, but instead finance steps in and starts loaning money to people. So in, a, in effect, the capitalists, instead of raising people's wages, you loan them the money so they can buy the stuff instead, okay. But, you know, that starts compounding, that can't go on, so we got a crisis. Now, if that's the correct analysis, what are the prospects for getting out of this? Uh, because it seems to me the standard Keynesians is a real problem here because, you know, on the one hand, uh, how is labor going to get their wages back up again? You've got globalization, companies can threaten to move and so on and so forth, so that doesn't seem in the cards. Moreover, the stimulus packages, we run into the multiplier problem. The idea used to be that, yeah, you put somebody to work, you give them a job the government does, and they buy things, and that puts your other people to work, and so on and so forth. But now you give money to people, they're, they're desperate, they go to the lowest price place they can go, Walmart. That may put some Chinese workers to work, but it doesn't put you know, your own colleagues to work, so the, the stimulus has to be much, much bigger. You know, I don't see any way out of this, and I wonder if you know, anyone else does. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that last question because I really ran out of time to talk about what is to be done, uh, as if that's an easy question to answer or even pose. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the big question is uh, whether there will be a long-term stagnation reflecting the fact that uh, the way in which uh, the American working class is very broadly defined maintain their living standards despite stagnating wages uh, for three decades, which was through credit or through the wealth effect of their homes, uh, can be replicated. Now that is a global crisis because the ability of Germany and China uh, and Korea to transform their working classes so that they are consuming all that these export-oriented economies are producing even if one grants that as a possibility, is not a transition that can occur overnight. Okay, so I think the question is very well posed and very serious. That said, I think one shouldn't exaggerate. Uh, you know, the extent to which uh, uh, credit is still available, even to women, uh, uh, to working class consumers generally, partly because it's so built into the process of commodification and selling in the American market, uh, is quite remarkable. And I assure you there are a lot of working class people, even without jobs, who are getting consumer loans this Christmas. Uh, and, and then why you get quantitative easing, uh, why you had this massive uh, pouring of liquidity into the banking system, and not only the banking system, as we've just discovered, into the commercial paper market of all of the industrial firms that you were talking about uh, and the retail firms you were talking about is precisely in order to have them continue to provide this credit. Now, it is right that in terms of reducing the level of unemployment, uh, in terms of getting back to a higher rate of growth, although this is not negative growth in the United States, uh, that has not been successful. right? Uh, and we could be in for a long period of relatively low growth. That doesn't bring the system to a halt. Let's recognize that. And, you know, I think we need to get our heads around that capitalism can be a society that can last a hell of a long time longer with rates of unemployment of the kinds that we know, with the kind of precariat that we know, uh, et cetera. And that's what we may be facing, and it still may remain quite a dynamic system in terms of the development of new industries, which may not be creation, creating high jobs, high wage jobs, uh, but it can hell, last a hell of a time, long time longer. Now, in this respect, I've been struck by, as an outsider, either the astonishing populism or the astonishing timidity of the American left, including American left intellectuals. The initial response, which one still hears, in which people pretend to be Bernie Saunders, I can understand why Saunders does it, but why intellectuals should do it. Why are you bailing them out? Well, you're bailing them out because workers' pensions and wages are in there. Their livelihoods, the roofs over their heads are in there. You're, you're stopping the freezing of the interbank market. 
And if the interbank market isn't operating, the whole system collapses, and it, the financialization of, of working people's lives goes with it. That's why you're bailing them out. Not because your buddies in Goldman, in Goldman Sachs is there, although you'd have difficulty at a, at a cocktail party on the Upper East Side if you didn't bail them out in terms of not being treated very well. But that's not it. That is not the main thing. So that populism is really quite astonishing. Rather than teaching people that this system is structurally dependent on the types of shysters that Edmund was talking about, the types of rapacious people who are structurally at the core of reproducing capitalism. That's what needs to be said. In that respect, the timidity is astonishing. Dean Baker, who understands this stuff better than anybody, what does he call for as a reform? He calls for an upper limit of $2 million on Wall Street salaries, right? And a, a, a uh, Tobin tax, which will throw some sand into the wheel. It's a bit like a tobacco tax. You fund the state by funding the problem, right? Uh, by taxing the problem. Uh, it, is, it is truly astonishing that here, for instance, at the University of Chicago, how terrific it would be if a group like this came out and called for banking to become a public utility in this country. It can't exist with, without deposit insurance, right? It can't exist without the state being a lender of last resort. How terrific it would be at the University of Chicago if a group of leading intellectuals issued a public statement calling for banking to be a public utility. The one economist who called for it is no Marxist. It was Willem Boyder at the LSE. I understand he's just become chief economist of Citibank. He called for it in the Financial <laughs> Times. Right? Uh, secondly, it's astonishing that people just talk vaguely about stimulus. We had the largest stimulus, you had the largest stimulus, in post-war history on, in last year. It didn't have the effect you would like it to have. It had some effect. It would have been much worse without it, right? It bailed out, effectively, states with enormous deficits. But the only thing that is going to quickly turn this around is direct public employment. That's the only, that's what Roosevelt finally did, under enormous pressure from below, of course. But it was a WPA. Right? Now that can employ people from building dams to building all the things that should have been done in the 1970s in terms of public housing, when instead, and I'm not a great fan of the Community Reinvestment Act, left-wing democratic politicians, yes, got black people into the financial system. And that was a victory, it was a reform. But that was also the basis upon which you got the secondary mortgage market. And it was upon that that the subprime market was built. Of course, it took Clinton's further reforms. It took, of course, every shyster to get into the business, as I said, later in, in, uh, when Bush came in. But the roots of it had to do with, rather than public housing, after the great society programs were ended, you, the, the, the victories, of the reform victories, were to get people into the credit system as, as capitalist consumers. And this brings me to Beverly's, I thought, key point at, at, at last week. And, and it, it comes back to the United States, yesterday morning, it comes back to the United States as well. The militancy of the Chinese working class is, is, could be historic. I think it's very important. But the question for people on the left is whether that militancy is going to lead to the kind of trade unionism that will win individual consumerism, which is what trade unionism in North America and, most, and Europe and social democratic Europe ended up being, rather than the winning of collective services, rather than the winning of decommodification. Because as Polanyi knew and said, that was not won after 1945 in Europe. The wage increases went to commodification. Right? And, and for us, the big question then becomes, and it's a very long-term question, whether if this is a long crisis of the 1873 to 96 kind, which it may well be, whether there will be a long-term process of producing the types of working class institutions, which the current trade unions and parties cannot be, right, which will put again socialism back on the agenda. Uh, that's a long-term process. It's not going to happen overnight. But one needs to get beyond thinking about the stimulus and start thinking about how do we organize those types of institutions over the next 10, 20 years. Um, maybe, could we have uh, Greta? Let me, let me address um, the other dimension of the, yeah. I was going to give Greta over. Oh, great. And then 
Uh, so um, Peter asked whether um, the uh, questioned my assumption about uh, there not being a Gilded Age politics and suggested that the Tea Party actually is that politics. And I, I very much agree with that statement. In fact, um, well, as I noted in the, in the beginning of the paper, the Tea Party is the notable exception. But it's an exception that I think is consistent um, with the argument I'm making. And this goes to um, some resemblances that I think do exist between uh, the Tea Party movement and those um, 19th century uh, Gilded Age movements, as well as with the, uh, the neighborhood uh, reinvestment movement in the 70s that I described. And that is, uh, in various ways, these are all ownership movements, I think. So to the extent that the Tea Party movement, you know, it's a little hard to pin them down. They're sort of all over the place. But to the extent that they are a movement that uh, in, has a position on, on credit and financial uh, man, uh, matters, you know, they did, um, you know, come together, uh, you know, at least in the sort of mythology as a kind of reaction to the financial bailout that was a kind of taxpayer taxpayer politics, the idea that, uh, you know, something that is, is mine is being taken away from me, usurped inappropriately. So I see a, a connection there in terms of um, the arguments that were made by the reinvestment movement in terms of these are our resources, they're being usurped um, inappropriately. So, I mean, I, th I think that's the, the broad argument of the paper is to the extent that we do see... Um, a movement around credit and financial uh, politics, it will be in, in this ownership idiom rather than uh, in terms of the kind of claims around, you know, either sort of narrowly constructed claims of discrimination or sort of broader social citizenship right to credit, um, both of which were um, alternative formulations that were available in the 70s and, and I think were foreclosed for various reasons. Um, so, I mean, I think in, in general, I mean, I, I'm in complete agreement with your comment and I think uh, I you know would like to develop that more and I didn't fully have time but uh, you know I think we do see a lot of continuity in terms of you know the this kind of emphasis on ownership and again that I you know I think that's the form in which we can expect to see politicization around around finance and credit and just one thought on that I mean even thinking about the um, foreclosure uh, crisis uh, you know, to me, it's very notable that to the extent there's now starting to be a response to that, it's, you know, in terms of um, banks who have not exercised due diligence in, in, in foreclosing individuals and, and therefore, you know, are violating individual property rights, not uh, so much in terms of the idea that people have a right to housing, which is how we might have expected uh, that politics to play out had it, you know, occurred in the 1970s rather than you know, in, our, in our current moment. So I mean, the, the idea that um, you know, the issue with foreclosure is a violation of individual property rights rather than um, you know, a kind of preemption of, of, a, of a fundamental right to housing, I think, is, is also very consistent. So I, I see a, a you know, kind of broad consistency here in, 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 uh, in many of these uh, movements. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Peter for suggesting my next paper. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I expect that you'll be co-author on this one. Um, the, the cause of the crisis was the kind of systemic risk that occurs because there's an absence of liquidity. The absence of liquidity means that I actually presuppose that my counterparty might be um, uh, indirectly or covertly solvent precisely because they have no access to their balance sheet. When you have this form of systemic risk, the only way to really deal with it is through an external source. In this case, the source was the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, of course, intervened on a number of levels. It bought a large percentage of Citibank and Bank of America. Um, it uh, imbued a tremendous amount of capital into Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, and a variety of other, um, other institutions. Um, the consequence of this, of course, was that they were permitted to repair their balance sheets. Most effectively, they actually instituted a policy to transfer wealth from American citizens to the banks. And the policy was instituted by allowing the banks to borrow money at a quarter percent and invest it in treasury bonds at 3%. Um, and this was essentially a transfer of wealth from the citizenry to the banks to repair their balance sheets. At the same time, there was no regula regulatory transformation in what, in fact, the banks could do. So one of the things that you see over the past several months is an increase in leverage buyout 
an increase in collateralized debt obligations, an increase in collateralized mortgage obligations. In fact, precisely the same sorts of instruments that created the problems are in fact being amplified each month in terms of the, in terms of the billions of dollars in circulation. Uh, so as far as, as, far as, as far as I can see, there is um, an, extraordinarily, an extraordinary likelihood that precisely the same sort of crisis that occurred will in fact occur again if in fact there is not some sort of regulatory measure taken. Okay, um, I think that um, we've run over time and we have precious little time for coffee breaks. So uh, let uh, me and everyone else give their thanks to our panelists. And, uh, <laughs>